Hello everyone, welcome to Voices at the SEO Center. Uh, this is the second edition in a series of interviews that we're doing on non-personal data and issues associated with it. Today we're joined by Mr. Chaitanya Murthy, who is a computer engineer from the Illinois Institute of Technology and currently a PhD student at the Robert Bosch Center for Cyber-Physical Systems at IISC Bangalore. Uh, Mr. Murthy, thank you for joining us today. Hi, good to talk to you guys. So the interview, so the idea for today's interview, as well as for a couple of uh, forthcoming interviews, is to talk to people who deal with data in various ways, either that's as data practitioners or on, from an academia perspective, and to get insights into the challenges, etc., that they face when ex when accessing such data. So I feel a good place to start for that would be to understand the nature of work that you're doing, Mr. Murthy. Okay, so I work on. Uh problems in autonomous systems, machine learning, and sort of the control theoretic aspect of it. Uh, so autonomous systems mean systems that can work by themselves, like driverless cars or pilotless drones that you know can deliver something without having someone sit there, play with a joystick and so on. Machine learning, of course, is uh, sort of trying to learn patterns from data and make decisions based on that. Mm -hmm. and learn how to do that. And control is basically the, the sort of the mathematical discipline of uh, making dynamical systems, which are systems that are modeled or governed by differential equations, right. behave in a manner that is uh, desirable. By, and that will vary depending on the application. Um, so broadly, I work in sort of the intersection of these three things. Right. So the work that I think got your interest was one on efficient machine learning, which is uh, which sort of tries to ask the question, how can we make uh, machine learning models, which are generally very, very large, scale down to applications that don't allow you to use massive computing resources? Mm -hmm. So for example, if I want to be able to fly a drone autonomously, right. and I want to use, say, a neural network-based model, how would I do so, given that I can't mount you know, my workstation on top of a you know, one-foot-by-one-foot drone? Understood. So, so our work focused mainly on the algorithmic aspect of this. So can we design an algorithm that can shrink a neural network basically uh, to the extent that it is small enough to use on a very small low power device that uh, can be mounted on a drone or something similar, similarly small. Right. Okay. So if I understand this correctly, Mr. Murthy, there would be a set of data which you would be using to train this particular algorithm to begin with to operate in a certain right. manner. And then there would be data that is generated as a result of the operation of this algorithm. So that would be what your drone captures or what an automotive vehicle, automatic automotive vehicle, yeah. uh, the feedback that it presents to you. So um, yeah. this is particularly interesting from the perspective of non-personal data because uh, firstly, coming to the training data, how, how do you usually obtain this data? What is the process that goes into collecting it, collating it? So training data, um, we literally mounted some cameras on a car and drove around the campus. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that is literally how we collect data. Right. Um, in the academic setting, generally things like that, or uh, you kind of generate it in simulation, or you use what are known as standard data sets, right. which are data sets that are widely used in, in academia, you know, that are referred to in a very, very large number of papers. And they're sort of seen as uh, benchmarks that you have to, right. not have to, but that are desirable to meet. Right? So in this particular instance, like I said, we collected the data ourselves, um, just mounted cameras on a car and drove around. Because the key thing was to get uh, images of, of the roads themselves. Right? Sure. Um, so in our paper, we actually have two data sets. One is one from our campus, and the other one is from uh, Forest outside Lugano. So that second data set we, is actually from an earlier paper that was published uh, a few years ago, I think, or three years ago. Um, and uh, they had released their data, their data set online, so they hadn't sort of collated it properly. So we had to go through and, you know, weed out all the, the bad images and so on. Um, so going to this question of private, of uh, personal and non-personal data, 
there really isn't this really didn't even come to the equation at all right because uh for the forest trails data set um there are literally no people at all occasionally you'll see like a street sign or something but that's it and the same and for for our road data set um again there was this question of of personal data didn't show come up um because i think at least thus far things like license plates and sort of yeah. random image capture of someone doesn't hasn't really been an issue uh for people so collecting data uh, for these kind of applications um and this is reflected in other data sets as well right and and these are the uh, the very widely available autonomous driving data sets right like the byu data set for example you'll find a lot of uh, a lot of of pictures of cars or of license plates will show up and that kind of thing uh, so, so from, we didn't really have to worry about it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so from what i gather i understand that there are data sets which are otherwise available pre existing data sets which you can access if required i was just wondering um how easy is it for you to access these kinds of data sets you're saying they're widely available but if are you have you come across any niche data sets which you sort of require to access but they've been behind say a paywall or a subscription service or something of that sort i have it um and in general um this is not something that we really worry about too much mm -hmm. because it would have to be really niche to or proprietary right for us not to have at least some sort of ready access to it because most people nowadays you know you put your you put your data sets especially if you're coming up with a new data set you post it on uh, on github or on a website or what have you right um so these these are not really concerns that bother us um especially because a lot of this kind of work that we're doing um is sort of a, a very popular area in academia you know a lot of people are working on this so right. data is there's no problem with that at all mm -hmm. um i will say however that um, there are a lot of companies that won't allow you to access their data even for things like this for example tesla you can't really get a hold of their data even though they've got literally you know thousands of terabytes of it right um but again it doesn't really affect us because um quite frankly from the academic setting it doesn't really make sense any way to have to use that much data where because you really when you're writing a paper you're really trying to prove an idea right. rather than have a end to end application ready so there's really no issue at all with data sets right and another aspect of the access uh, issue is infrastructure in general so having worked both abroad in illinois arizona and now having come back to india do you feel issues with say uh, bandwidth internet speed interoperability of data sets etc are some things which you're facing in india more than you did when you were abroad or, or do you feel your experience is fairly similar across both the nations and other jurisdictions yeah look i mean it's it's fairly similar the in terms of internet and all that mm -hmm. uh so internet speeds in india are fine now all right maybe you'll have to spend a couple more hours downloading a data set but it doesn't really matter okay i mean it's not it's not it's not it's not the deal breaker really the the more challenging thing is access to computing resources okay um because uh and it's it's, it's really just cost mm -hmm. um so sort of in terms of infrastructure the real the real challenge um and even then it's not it's not by any means a an insurmountable challenge um even on a case by case basis is um getting and building high power computers uh for student use okay. or for researcher use i i i know for a fact that if you're at a company like microsoft research or at amazon or wherever even in india these problems absolutely don't come up at all um because i mean as long as you can pay for it it's fine Right. and so things like if you want to use cloud services like amazon web services to host your data and to host your and to run your algorithms on uh, it costs money to do that so you need to have someone pay for an account that means pulling money out of the ground but again it's not it's 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 a hurdle but it's not a bad one it's right so and this is the same problem you'd have anywhere so it's not something that's proving to be too innovating to your research no not at all right not at all um but now, again i mean 
experiences may vary depending on where you are. Of course. Thank you. So that's the only thing. So I see in Bangalore, these things are not an issue here. Right. So now coming to the second form of data that is generated, which is the output data. And uh, yeah. this, of course, from an academia perspective, isn't something that you're really looking to monetize or gain money out of. You're doing it for the purpose of research and as you said, more to prove an idea. So the relevance yeah. of the output data doesn't matter as much. But um, sure. Generally, is there, as a result of that, are there any protections that you put in place for this data or anything of that sort to restrict access to it? I mean, really we, store it on, we, we store it on computers that are accessed only by people. And I mean, it's not, we don't, these are not readily available, the output data. But that's more of a function of the fact that the output data is really meaningless um, insofar as uh, the drone collecting data on a mission is, is worthless. I mean, it, it does absolutely nothing for anybody. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this is to kind of have, to enable a drone to perform a task while using uh, sort of available infrastructure, even if there may not, it may not be perfectly you know, separable and so on and so forth. Right. Um, that's to say like, if it should, even if it's not perfectly neat, like the roads are, the road boundaries are not, you know, mm -hmm. clearly delim delineated and so on. Um, so in that regard, uh, we didn't really even need to think, we didn't think about the problem at all because uh, that data was, is, the only time we use it is when we try and actually say, okay, now look, this is, when you, you see the drone, you see how the decisions change as it sees different images of the roads as it, as it goes along. Um, I can certainly imagine applications, however, where such protections would be needed. Um, so if you're doing something like this kind of um, machinery that we developed can be used to um, enable drones to do autonomous infrastructure management or uh, not management, uh, maintenance so and surveillance. Such a management. Surveillance, yeah. 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 And you know, like surveillance of a compound, for example. Um, so in, in, in those cases, yes, that data would need to be protected. Though that has, that's not really part of our problem. Right. On this. Uh, right, understood. So in this particular context, there's actually a provision in the most recent draft of the personal data protection bill that allows the government to request any agency to provide it with anonymized personal data or non-personal data of all forms. And as of now, we don't know what the particulars of this mandate from the government could possibly be. But in that situation where the research that you're producing here, I'm seeing it in two distinct components. Firstly, there are the data sets which you've created, which are training the algorithm, which are the two data sets that you spoke of, which is a forest, uh, forest trail and campus roads, right? Yeah. And then the second is the data that you're generating from the drone, which as of now has no particular relevance to you, but we've discussed how it could possibly have policy benefits and how it could be used from that perspective. So in this situation, if it is mandated that you have to provide such data to the government, possibly without there being any remuneration or royalties for the same, how would that impact your incentives to carry out this research in the first place? Would that impact it at all? No, no, not at all. Anyway, look, our data is available online. So right. Anyone can go and download it. And right. uh, so, I mean, part of the, the reason why this is this is not an issue is because um, in academia, there's we have to our, our results must be replicable, and you can't really say that they're replicable if you're if the data you're using isn't available to everyone. Understood. So, so it's, it's not it's not even a concern. Right. But again, let me let me let me add to that and say that if I were to say, have a startup, mm -hmm. then this data is very, very valuable yes. to me, right? So um, in the, just like I, I mentioned the, the example of Tesla uh, a little while ago. So their data is proprietary. They don't make it available. And um, perhaps a good part of it would fall under this personal data. I, because I mean, uh, it's taken from the car itself. Uh, might be anonymized. I, I, I don't know. I just happen to know that they have huge amounts of data. Um, but uh, yeah, so in that case, then my data becomes valuable. And then it becomes a question of, okay, now this is, uh, this is a little more tricky. Because if this data that I've collected, I've put invested money and time into 
and now someone can just come in and start using it without uh, without paying me for it. Right. That's a problem. Right. And uh, I think that is where these kind of things become contentious. Right. So I think from a regulatory perspective, what I'm really gathering from this discussion is that it would possibly be unwise to regulate all forms of data in uh, in a, in one standard manner, given that the applications and the purpose that you're using it in academia from a commercial perspective or for a startup are so vastly different that if you were to apply one single set of regulations governing non-personal data, it could possibly lead to undesirable results on both sides, even for academia as well as for the tech uh, startup ecosystem and for other companies which are involved in this. Is that something you would agree with? Uh Yes and no. And so far as yes, I think that different kinds of non-personal data should be treated differently. But I think everyone benefits if non-personal data is not really regulated. As long as there's no harm being done. It's as long as you know there's no there's no adverse effects to people in general, I don't see why it's a question at all. Okay. I mean, this is this is coming from a very naive standpoint. So I mean I'm sure there's plenty of nuance there that I've totally missed. Mm -hmm. But for data like, like what we've collected, there's really, I mean, what are you going to regulate about it? Right. Right. Um, I guess one could say that, look, you can't have people's license plates showing up in the data set or something like that. But uh, so sort of to counter that, every data set that people have been writing papers with for the last, let's say, 10 years has instances where this kind of, where, you know, license plates pop up. Occasionally you'll have a guy walking his dog. You know, small things like that. It's, but there's no linking the, so, I mean, and even then it's just saying that, look, this guy was in this city at this time. Right. Roughly at this time. Right. Even then it's not exactly precise. Um, so I guess I would say yes to, to, to sort of summarize. I would agree that different kinds of non-personal data should be treated differently. Um, even if it's only in minor details, I mean, that effort should be taken, I think. So for example, if I have, you know, for the trails data set that we have, or if I say that, um, uh, like, you know, stuff like newspaper data. So a lot of, uh, data is used in natural, natural language processing, uh, research is basically compilations of articles, from newspapers, which are annotated with certain keywords that are noted out that kind of thing should be, perhaps need different kinds of regulation, but regardless of what regulations there are and how they differ, they should be sort of, uh, my, my gut instinct is to see that they should be light. Right. It shouldn't be heavy handed. It shouldn't, it should be as minimal as possible. Right. Personal data, yeah, that's a, that's a fully different ball game, but yeah. I think uh, this has been a very enlightening discussion. Mr. Murthy, I've gathered some insights which will help me frame my, um, policy recommendations with regards to non-personal data in a better manner, especially coming from the academia perspective. As I said earlier, and as we discussed, I hope to gather perspectives from um, other practitioners who perhaps deal with data in a more, in a manner where they're looking to monetize it, earn from it, as opposed to using it to prove ideas and to put forth their views. And um, that is something that we're hoping to do in the forthcoming editions. Uh, thank you so much for having joined us here today. And uh, sure, anytime.